Arun, um, who is a friend of probably more than quarter of a century. Um, he is, in my view, one of India's great speakers on um, freedom and poverty and environmentalism. Um, Barun, you know that for me, you're one of the great speakers when it comes to um, understanding really granular and detailed issues around poverty. Not, how can I say this, not some of the fantasy views that many of our journalists have, but some of the, the, the real ground truths about the grinding difficult realities that many people face. India, in many ways, uh, is a huge success story. Um, since your independence, um, I think that India is going to continue, going to continue to grow and it will become a great um, world power. Um, um, you are one of my favourite thinkers, one of my favourite writers, and it's a huge honour to have you with us this evening and to talk us through um, uh, Gandhi's wheel and the implications that you think it holds uh, for what is going on in your country and your country's future. I'm sure you're going to touch on some past and, and talk about the present and move us into the future. But ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Barun Mitra. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tim. It was nice seeing you after a while. And good evening, all of you who've joined. Uh, it's quite late at night here in Delhi. It's past midnight. But uh, still, let me see if I can stay awake and keep you awake. Yeah, I mean, um, as Tim knows, um, I'm not an academic or a scholar. I, I probably won't get an admission in most universities these days. So I've, I've, I've taken this opportunity that you offered to think aloud something that had been in my mind for a while. And I'd been working on it over the last few years, including the last two months uh, at different places in different ways. So let's see how it goes. And I'm looking forward to hearing comments and criticisms uh, so that I can learn a bit from this evening and build forward for tomorrow. So uh, uh, how, how can I share my screen so that I can see the slides or I could share the slides or I could just go along. Um, apologies, I'll just give you that access now. Thank you. Varun, what time is it with you in, 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 in New Delhi at the moment? What time is it with you? It's quarter to 1 a.m. Goodness gracious me. I'm so sorry about that. Um, yeah, but, I didn't realize that that was the scheduled time when I agreed, but uh, still it's okay. It's okay. Okay, okay that should be available okay. now for share screening. Ah, there we are. I think something is coming through. Brilliant. Yeah, how do I? Uh, yeah. Can you see the screen? We can. Great. So like I said, this is one of the iconic pictures of Gandhi with his wheel, the spinning wheel. Although in this one, he's not working the wheel. And I want to, this is what I'd been exploring, I'd been thinking of for a while now, that how relevant is Gandhi in the 21st century? And the reason is partly what Tim said, that while India has defied a lot of predictions of doom and collapse, yet India is quite far, in fact, quite far from fulfilling the promise that it had. And that had actually led me to look back at the man who in a way helped shaped the identity of India uh, through his 30 odd years of political social activism in the early part or in the first half of the 20th century. Yeah, so this is what Gandhi says about the wheel. 
because it's important to realize um, why he chose the wheel and how he saw, looked at it as something much more than just a spinning device to spin out some yarn. It was actually a way, it was his way of creating a viral movement as we are saying today, that something that millions could identify, something that could help Indians who didn't think of themselves as Indians, but on class, caste, race, religion, and all the, all the lines of social fractures. And he sought to unite through the wheel, the rich and the poor, through all the fractures of society. And that's why the wheel was not just a mere instrument to spin yarn. It was much deeper and much, more, much broader than that. And I think this needs to be kept in mind because that's what will make it relevant in our discussion today. Some of the things that he sought from the wheel, which is like I said, as a way to inculcate a sense of unity through some common features, including overcoming some of the common challenges that India has, which is one is the work ethics through the wheel and the dignity of labor. That is the rich and the poor could use it as one, instru as one shared common instrument. It could meet some socioeconomic needs, but it, could all, it would also instill a sense of discipline and self-restraint, which he thought was extremely critical for a country to be self-governed. And of course, the self-worth, the courage, and the confidence of taking up something that you don't know. Underlying all this was, of course, the two essence of Gandhi's life, that is nonviolence and crafting the identity of India, a common identity, a shared identity of India. And therefore, I look at Gandhi not as a Mahatma or the great soul, but as an entrepreneur. He identified a problem. He tried to search for solutions. And most interestingly, he tried to find a few, find the process through which the solution could be achieved. Most of the time, we think we understand the problem and then we propose a solution, but we forget how that solution can actually be implemented. And Gandhi therefore looked at the solution as a movement, not as a pill that people could swallow. It needed to be participative and it is through the process of participation that education and awareness of the issues could be brought about. It was not an intellectual movement, but it was actually a social movement through which millions could share a common vision. Something of this nature had hardly been attempted any time before, of this scale particularly. It said, and, and this process is critical because, because of this Gandhi's insistence on this kind of a participative broad, broad based process, that he could reach out to millions, in fact, far more voluntarily participated in the movement than any of his contemporaries, whether it is Lenin or Stalin or Mao or Hitler even. And what is more startling is because of his insistence on nonviolence, the marginalized sections of society, including women could participate at a scale that a Mao or a Hitler could only dream of. I think this is his achievement that he, he sought to make citizens claim ownership over their community and country. It was not something that would come to them as gift, but something they could earn as an owner. 
And in the process, he continuously warned of the dangers of expanding the scope of the state. This last point is something that we need to keep in mind, particularly in today's world, whether the state has had almost a free hand in the last two years to expand itself beyond our wildest dreams or fears. To end the story about the wheel, it has been, uh, there's been a lot of misperceptions. The spinning wheel is seen as Luddite and anti-technology. It's anti-modern, it's un impractical, it's uneconomic, it's ritualistic. But like I said, Gandhi was looking at the wheel much more than the wheel itself, that is the physical form of the wheel. He was using the wheel to expose the contradiction between liberal values and the spread of mercantilism and imperialism at the same time. He was using the wheel to caution people of how the state would expand in the name of modernity and trade in the garb of liberalism, something very few in his generation had, but something which even a Britisher like Edmund Burke had warned during the French and the American uh, revolution and his opposition to, or his, his uh, apprehensions regarding British imperialism in India. To understand this, we need to understand the two elements on which Gandhi relied and which I think most of us understand one part of it or many of us coming from a liberal, a libertarian perspective generally understand one side of it that is the voluntary nature of private transaction, the mutual consent, the win-win that such voluntary transactions create, the trust and credibility and reputation that it helps build. But what many of us forget Precisely because we rely on the state to maintain the voluntariness of social economic uh, transactions. What, what we ignore, and which I think, again, in my view, not many, particularly not hardly any political leaders of the era uh, could identify and articulate that every action of the state is a manifestation of violence. You know, something that we can hardly, we hardly hear anybody say that when we demand the state to expand its role and we complain that we are being plagued by corruption and by cronies who are capture, trying to capture the state. That every action of the state is manifestation of violence is something when I realized from readings of Gandhi, I was quite stunned because I really didn't expect this to come from somebody who had, uh, or perhaps I should have expected it to come from someone who had uh, even prided himself in, in calling, him, uh, calling himself as an anarchist uh, in his generation. And this brings me to the Indian paradox of the post-independent India, the Gulf the wide gulf between the promise in 1947 when we got independence and in 50 when the constitution came in and today in the performance that we have achieved or we have not achieved. So politically, we are the largest democracy. We have defied virtually every political project uh, predictions, including by many Indians. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s that India as a country may not survive. Yet we have incredible social uh, tumult, tumultuous social surrounding, which is continuing even today. If any of you following the news from India would know that there are million mutinies on the streets almost on a daily basis and a major one had been going on for the past one year uh, where the Indian farmers objected to certain policies of the government. 
Likewise, on the economic side, we have extreme wealth. In the last couple of years itself, the number of billionaires from India has increased or almost doubled. At the same time, we have abject poverty. This, this contrast is startling. And in my view, it can be only explained by the unrestrained expansion of the state, something that Gandhi had been warning ever since he came to India, something we in India have mostly forgotten. That while we confront this contradiction, we point fingers at various factors and actors, but we forget that at every solution that we seek, we have sought to expand the scope of the state. And the result has been not just the contradictions and the contrast, but also spread of corruption and normalization of violence in society. This stands in contrast to Gandhi's talisman, where he said that when we think of a policy, we must recall the face of the poorest and the weakest in front. Is, is what we propose going to help him or her or not? The contrast that India is today suggests that we have forgotten the face of the poorest and the weakest because we can always escape in, uh, while looking at uh, the largest democracy with some of the wealthiest people in the world. This brings me to the other aspect of, uh, of uh, not just India, but many parts of the developing, developing world. That is the informal economy. The economy, the activities that markets uh, that have market value, but are not formally registered or even recognized at many times. It's difficult to define and measure. Yet by every estimation, the pandemic and the lockdowns have hit the informal sector the hardest. The poorest have been hit the hardest. Yet it plays, the informal economy plays a very central role in the development process itself. And it has throughout history. On the other hand, we tolerate yet fail to appreciate the value of the informal. We look at it from a utilitarian point of view that it's a social safety valve that lets the steam off. A lifeline where hardly any social security exists or it is a pathway for tax evasion or a handmaiden of the criminal, a criminal having a say in the economy. But the informal economy, in my view, is, a cha uh, uh, is an important, is a critical link in the chain because a chain is as strong as its weakest member, as Gandhi said in his talisman that or in any community, the strength of the community would depend on how on the weakest members capacity to carry the community along. Even today, the informal economy, particularly in the developing world is very large. The IMF estimates it to be 60% of the world's population participating in the informal economy. In Asia Pacific, it's even larger, close to 70%. In India, it is variously said that 90% of India's workforce is engaged in the informal sector. Although it contributes almost 50% of GDP. Include, that of course include much of uh, agriculture, most of agriculture and most of the micro and small sectors of the economy. It said that 95% of India's 
businesses employ uh, two to five people. So you can understand the size and scale of the informal activity in India. And this is a very typical scene in most Indian cities or towns or villages. A street market, uh, or you could say, I, I look at them as barefoot capitalism, that people exchanging values without a quarrel 99.9% .9 of the time. It's a, it's a platform where the rich and the poor can rub shoulders and part ways amicably. There's hardly an illustration of, of, uh, of such a platform, uh, which is so common, which is so everyday, yet on the other side, there's, there lies a tragedy. Let me see if this, uh, if this internet link would work. Let me try. Because it's worth seeing. I'll just a clip. This is one of the vendors of oh, the ads. I we're think not, I'm still. We're not currently able to see the. Um... Yeah, let me cover it. Let me go back to my presentation. What I wanted to show that was a that was a video of a major news channel, pretty recent one, which showed the daily harassment that these vendors go through on the streets at the hands of the police or at the hands of the municipalities, municipal authorities. That's primarily because while millions trans uh, engage in these transactions, the sellers typically are deemed or seen as illegal encroachers on public land. And therefore they are open to abuse on a daily basis while the authorities collect millions of dollars as protection money from, from these, uh, these uh, poor vendors. 10 years ago, a law was passed to recognize the legitimacy of these vendors, to give them an ID and ask the local authorities to designate areas where they could practice their trade. While quite a few people have got their IDs, there's hardly a city or town in India that have designated a place for them to function. As a result, 10 years after the law, most of them are as vulnerable as they were or have ever been, which is a tragedy because while India's population has grown three times since independence, or close to four times, the area designated for markets, that is legalized markets for daily functions, daily living has not increased at all, which is why they are on the streets and which is why millions buy and sell on the streets. And yet we look at that as illegal and therefore at the mercy of the law and the law enforces. Give, let me give you another glimpse, which is kind of my favorite. Uh, uh, you could say a history, a brief history of transportation in India, which is actually not history, which is even today. The bullock cart, which is uh, when, whose number in the 1970s, the number of bullock carts in India were, uh, were more than number of trucks. Today, their numbers have shrunk, but they're still there in virtually every village. A cycle cart, 
a very common feature in most parts of India. A slightly modified mechanized version. This is the story from which I began to understand the significance of uh, in the informal economy in India. The grassroots entrepreneurs who build these homemade contraptions, literally. They started in the, sometime in the late 70s and 80s. And I discovered them in the early 90s. My first article in the Wall Street Journal was about these vehicles that plied in the streets, uh, in, the, in the highways and interior parts of India, particularly North India. And they continue even today. While the Indian economy and the automobile sector in India has been transformed, uh, there are probably one vehicle for every 100 Indians today. But these vehicles have continued. These homemade contraptions have continued. They are being manufactured literally and by village mechanics sitting under trees who are semi-literate, but have the functional capacity and understanding of how to make it work. Because they have, uh, they have figure, uh, learned their lessons from the various agricultural equipments and machinery they have, they have been maintaining over the last few decades in rural India. So they put up these, uh, these water pump diesel engines, put up our chases, fix a gearbox and the wheels, and they, uh, they create these vehicles. My original estimate or uh, assessment was that we'll begin to see them just less than 100 kilometers outside of Delhi. In the 1990s, I used to see them very frequently. Today, they're much less frequent, at least on the highways, but in the interior, they're still very frequent because this is a picture I took uh, just uh, in 2019, the summer of 2019. So they're predominant. This is something I got, oops, what happened? Sorry. Yeah, this is the latest and I was impressed. This is a business vehicle and a camper. This is a contraption I had never seen before in such elaborate detail. This is a business that crushes sugarcane and sells juice, fresh juice to people on the streets. And the family, the farmer, his wife, and in this case, a daughter travels in this vehicle. They can sleep on the top and they can drive it to any place they want, sell their, sell their uh, juice and either go home or go to move to another village. A contraption that will not be recognized by the law, but a contraption that has a whole supply chain to manufacture, to distribute, and to use, to, uh, providing economic value to each actor at each level. Yet, they are visible, but they're invisible in the eyes of the law. And that's the tragedy of India. To me, this is the real tragedy of India in the last seven decades. Let me give you some figures before I conclude. This is the 70 years of India. The lines, the green, the blue, and the red are the number of people employed in agriculture, industry, and the service sectors. And the bars are the share of GDP in agriculture, industry, and the services. If you look at it, what you would notice is that agriculture 
which was over 50% of GDP has shrunk to less than 20. Yet agriculture continues to support uh, almost 50% or slightly under uh, the population, which means it's on the shoulders of Indian farmers, the poorest sec sections of India, that the largest section of India relies on. This is, there can't be anything more unjust, unequal, and unfair than what has, what, than this picture to me, which summarizes the Indian economy that that it is that it has evolved to that industry and services have grown but the employment in these have barely moved which means and which is what which is why i i i spoke about the informal sector the informal sector exists not because people are interested in being informal. It exists because the cost of transaction in the formal sector is just too high. This is what this chart illustrates. That the formal economy in the, industri in the industrial and the service industry is so bogged down or tied up with regulation that people who ought to have moved from rural India simply cannot afford to do so. And therefore it falls on rural India to, to support half the population with 20% of the GDP. It's not because they want to stay rural. It's because it's the urban India, it's the non-rural India that has failed the Indians. But that's where all the glitter is. And therefore we get taken. But the glitter, actually, the glitter of urban India, of all the high tech and everything else that we see, is actually hiding the dark underbelly or the stranglehold of regulations that have prevented the normal economic transition that, uh, that India ought to have, ha ought to have had in order to fulfill its promise. You know, there's a lot of talk about China these days, but I like to look at South Korea because South Korea is a, is a middle-sized country, 50 million uh, population. And it is one of the original tigers, Asian tigers of the, uh, of, uh, in the economic, uh, in the sector of economic development. Because along with Hong Kong, Singapore and Taiwan, South Korea developed from abject poverty in the 1950s to a, a OE, to a member of the OECD, the rich, rich country club in 1996. An amazing transformation in 50 years. And this table, where I've circled the key figures actually illustrate this. India and, uh, and uh, South Korea were quite similarly placed in the 1950s. When, South Korea, when India got independence in 47 and South Korea was coming out of the civil war uh, or the Korean war uh, in the 1950s. By 1960, Indian agriculture contributed 41% of the GDP, South Korea, 37% of the GDP. 72% of India's workforce were in agriculture, 80% of South Korea's workforce was in agriculture. That was in 1960. Today, 18% of India's GDP comes from agriculture, 43% of employment is in agriculture. In South Korea, less than 2% of its GDP comes from agriculture. 
and the employment has fallen from 80% in 1960 to 5% today. And most of them are elderly on the verge of retirement. It is this transformation that South Korea has had, which India could have, but didn't. I'm comparing particularly with South Korea because Hong Kong and Singapore would be kind of brushed aside as city states. And Taiwan with its proximity to China and its history would be seen as in a different league. Therefore, to me, the comparison that India ought to go through is not so much China, but South Korea, because they did it a generation ago and we are still struggling. This is a new book, which I found fascinating. This is the cover, which I took, uh, Price of the Modi Years by Akar Patel, a human rights activist in India and a, and a columnist. This, this set of charts that he used in, his, in the cover of his book tells the trajectory of India over the past few years, particularly over the past decade. You see, most of the lines are red. There's only one black. And that black is the World Bank's doing business report, which the bank itself has now suspended because of uh, accusations and allegations that, that the index was being manipulated by countries who were gaming the system or gaming the parameters to, uh, for their benefit. This is an index where India jumped from around 130 to around mid 60s in five years. At a time when Indian economy has been on a downswing throughout the, almost throughout this period since 2016. We have never had such a prolonged economic slowdown where the economic growth rate had been declining for four years ever in 70 years of post-independent India. So this chart to me shows how far we might be thinking. And this is a warning to all of us. So sorry, I think we've just lost Burren just briefly. Um, hopefully we'll get him back in with us. I think he froze there, didn't he? Um, I have to say what, a, what an, a, an astonishing presentation uh, so far. Um, and that last slide really showing the recent decline um, across so many areas, human rights, freedom index, economic, you know, whatever. Um, I hope that Barun is able to come back and join us because um, I certainly have questions I'd like to raise and I'm sure I know other people uh, do as well. Um, Christiana, do you think you'll be able to get back in? Um, I do have his PowerPoint, so I'll just share that now, Tim. Hopefully, as soon as he joins us again, I'll be able to move him across. Oh. Brilliant. Uh, Christiana clearly has some um, issues on the home front, but she's sharing these brilliant slides. And clearly, we were on the last three or four there. Um, let's just wait a minute for him to rejoin us. Hopefully he will. Um, I 
I'm sure for those of you who are watching and still with us, you can see why I wanted Barun to address us. He is the most remarkable speaker and in many ways. Um, I think that what he has to say should not just be heard uh, by all of us in the Middlesex University community, be we staff or members of the local community or students or whatever. But I think his message should indeed continue to be heard across the pages of some of the world's most significant newspapers. Um, and really it should be heard in so many universities. So, uh, uh, because it's an extraordinary story of the granular detail. I've rarely met in my journey um, in academia and think tanks, um, in reading or writing, I've rarely met someone who has that extraordinary granular detail. So, the fact that we're trying to patch him in from Delhi. This is our attempt at a little bit of globalization. I wonder uh, if everything is okay over there. What do you think, Christiana? You're the technical expert. I wonder um, if I'm so sorry, Tim, and to everybody that's with us. Um, not being able to rejoin us currently, as soon as he does come back in, I'll pop him back across. Were there any of the slides you wanted me to just pop back to or? Would it be good to go back and maybe we could just briefly revisit where he was with all those graphs, where the charts were, had the blue, the, the sort of dozen or so. Uh, I think just keep going back, that one. I mean, look okay. at that. I mean, that's just extraordinary. Um, I'm assuming these indexes are from various places around the world that do these. I think the Legatum Institute in London, the Fraser Institute, probably in Canada, Heritage Foundation in Washington. I think he mentioned um, the IMF. There are so many think tanks and institutions that produce data on all the different countries in the world. But I have to say, this is the thing that find that I find so shocking, you know, just in recent years, look at that prosperity index, individual rights, rule of law. These are key elements for entrepreneurs. Um, 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 human development index. I mean, before this talk this evening, my impression was that India was almost universally on the up and, you know, probably across all the various dimensions, but so I'm really shocked to see this. Um, what I love about Barun is, yes, the, the granular detail. It's about being able to see things that are out there in plain sight, like the bullet cart, like uh, the development of those trucks. Um, but again, before this evening, I had no idea the number of people employed in what he defined as the informal economy and indeed the hassle they have um, uh, with authority, be it local government or people in the police service or local licensing officials and all the people who he seemed to be suggesting made life difficult for ordinary people or indeed was trying to take um, backhanders. Um, so uh, um, it's an extraordinary um, story. Thank you, Tim. Also, Elizabeth in our Q&A. Thank you for using our Q&A, Elizabeth, and I do encourage all our, our attendees to also um, join us at the very end. But interestingly, just, um, Elizabeth said in our Q&A that um, she thinks the story should be heard within our own UK government and that we'd learn much and that Brexit comes to mind. So, um... Um, Yes, that's an interesting point, and thank you for that. Um, I think I know well Barun well enough to say that he feels there is an enormous gulf uh, between what so many of us think about poverty um, in developing countries like India and the actual reality. Um, I think Barun knows better than most that, for example, 
we're not attuned to understanding the development of different types of motor vehicles on their streets, um, that we're not attuned to um, understanding the informal economy. You know, we like to number crunch the big stuff, the GDP figures, um, what he called the urban glitter. Um, but that actually for most people in uh, India, that urban glitter is not what their lives have made up as. And in fact, that's that might be growing and it might be more important, you know, it might be developing, but for most people in India, um, and, the, and the numbers were shocking, the overwhelming majority, the overwhelming majority, they were in the informal economy. So, um, and, 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 and that they weigh down the power uh, levels. Um, you know, they're not part of what he called a mercantilist or corporatist system that can often win legislative favor for their advantage. Um, uh, there's an Anne Elliott here, uh, and she asks, so if Korea cracked it, and UK did, when it moved to a more equal society, why didn't India? And that's a great question. In a way, Anne, that is the question, isn't it? So if there is out there some kind of tipping point um, where the glitzy bit, the urban bit, um, uh, and the growth simply can push through, um, then you reach hopefully some kind of tipping point which impacts um, the rest of the economy. And this is, this is the big question, this is the question. Why hasn't India reached that tipping point? Uh, and moreover, and this is the really shocking thing, why by all those measures bar one on the screen in front of you, why has India spent recent years in many ways going backwards? Um, and the truth is, I didn't know this. Uh, um, I didn't know this recent history. I didn't know that they've been going backwards on these through these dimensions in recent years. Um, what I did expect and what I do know is that when you want to understand the granular detail of people's lives, people who don't have a lot of voice or power, um, when you need to tap into the power of the powerless, well, you should be listening to people like Baron Mitra. Um, I wonder if there is not some real difficulty uh, at his end. I don't know what that could be. I know he's over there. In Baron's rejoined us. Thank you so much, Baron. Baron, are you Hello, Can you hear me? We can hear you. We lost you for a while. And yeah, I don't know what well, happened. I think the connection broke and then I struggled to reconnect. Well, um, yeah. I, I've been rambling for a while. So people have been suffering. Um, but thank goodness we have your great intellect and wisdom back with us, sir. So thank you. So can I share the screen? I just have a few more to we can conclude and have a discussion. Indeed. Um, Baron, I'm, I'm happy to um, move forward. So if you let me know which... Um, the next one. The next one, okay. Yeah. Oops, oh, the one, yeah, this one. This is something, this is where the connection broke. And uh, this is something that I'd been thinking of for a while because I came from that school of thought that believed in economic competition and free markets, but hadn't looked at the political side of the equation. But 10 years ago, I began to think that there is some merit to look at the political side of the equation and particularly that there might be a parallel between competition in the marketplace, economic market and competition in the political market. And this chart in a way illustrates that. What you see in the red line is the ups and downs of the GDP uh, growth rate in percentage. And what you see the green line is the trend line. That there's been a slow but a steady improvement over the 70 years. But what's interesting is if you look at the bottom, I don't know if you can read it, but I can share the uh, share the slide separately so you could perhaps re read it, but you can see the colors, I'm sure. 
there are names of prime ministers and the tenure that they served in office um, in blue. That is the blue ones are the prime ministers who had majorities in parliament. We have a parliamentary system like Britain and therefore majority in parliament is critical to form a government and, and run the government. And therefore the blue uh, boxes at the bottom are the names of the prime ministers who had absolute majority in our parliament, lower house of parliament. And the red ones, the prime minister whose names are in red are the ones who, who led coalition governments. What is interesting, actually, what is truly interesting is barring the first two, first two prime ministers who led coalition government in the late 70s, all the prime ministers in the night from the since the 1990s till 2014 all the prime ministers in this 25 year period were heading coalition governments and it is precisely during this time that india's economic liberalization and economic growth story began to shine through that it is political competition that is critical in providing a conducive environment for a productive, fruitful economic policies. Prime ministers with assured majorities have little, uh, little appetite for political risks and for reforms. Even if we ignore what happened last year, that is the lockdown and the pandemic, while the pandemic may have been a disease, but the lockdown was a policy choice. But even if we ignore that bit, what we see is that Indian economy, uh, the growth rate peaked in 2016 after a slow, after a rise since 2013. But since 16, it has been on a downswing, even before the pandemic. And since 2014, and again in 2019, we have a prime minister who got re-elected, uh, who elected in 2014, re-elected in 2019, even with an even larger majority. This to me is, is quite helpful in understanding why and how the hope that a prime minister with a majority will initiate steps to take India forward at a faster pace in a better direction has largely been belied. And if you go to the next slide, since I can't change the slide, please. Oh, I'm so sorry, it's just jammed. Let me see. Oh, there we go, yeah. sorry. This, the last two slides, to re remind what I said earlier from Gandhi, that every action of the state is manifestation of violence. What we have seen in 70 years is a continuous expansion of the state in the economic sphere, despite the spurts of economic reforms and liberalization that have occurred uh, sporadically in the 80s, more consistently in the 90s, and peaked in the first decade of the 21st century and then has kind of stumbled. That while the economic regulations have been modified, have been, they have been intensified again, particularly in recent years, but it has also been expanded from economic to social spheres that the state is now intervening and the pandemic has showed that the state is now willing and able to intervene in the name of health and safety even more vigorously than ever before. Which basically means that this, the, the nature of the state, that it is a manifestation of violence have been completely forgotten. And it, almost every section of society, particularly the political sections, look at the state 
for the solutions that they seek, ignoring that this expanding the scope of the state is institutionalizing violence, and that violence is getting normalized in society. This is a tragedy that had been building up and a tragedy that has been reinforced by the majority that the government today enjoys in parliament. Because those in power typically forget that there are three unsurmountable problems that any state faces. One regarding knowledge that they don't have, the incentives that they do have to expand their power and role. And of course, they wield the, the power, the levers of power, the physical power, the monopoly power over violence that the state enjoys. That we in India and a large chunk of the world has forgotten this actually made me look back at Gandhi in order to understand why was he so consistently and so strongly advocating nonviolence and warning Indians that relying on the state would be counterproductive. Next one, please. The next slide. I'm just um, going to move it across now. So sorry. There we go. Yeah. And this issue of the state or the role of the state brings me to another aspect of Gandhi that I began to realize, which is the distinction between the means and the ends. Most of us would generally agree on the ends that we seek. That is, ends at the warts, that no one, there's hardly anyone who would disagree that India should be free or India should be prosperous. The question is how or what means to adopt to, to get to what we want. And that is generally highly contentious. And that is what makes means much more significant or critical than the ends. Because ends is what we'll agree. Means is what we'll, we may disagree and can contest. And that is what has to be negotiated through the social and the political process, rather than using the alternative, which is adopting any means in the, um, in the name of uh, the ends that we agree on. And that is generally a recipe for disaster. And therefore, the next one, please. Yeah, this is Gandhi's warning in 1938, as valid today as, he, as when he made it, wrote it in his journal um, all those years ago. That democracy and violence can ill go together. The states today are nominally democratic, have either to become frankly totalitarian or if they are to become truly democratic, they must become courageously nonviolent. As long as we expect the state to be our savior, we are going to expand the scope of violence, whether through policy, implicitly or explicitly through the use of the power of the state since it enjoys a legal monopoly over force. And it has consequences both in terms of corruption across society and more, even more uh, critically, normalization of violence in society since the state itself is adopting that, that approach. And therefore, democracies across the world need to completely reassess how they should use the levers of state because it can cut and cut very deep. The next one, please. 
is the last one. And to end with Gandhi's, how he sought to balance ethics and economics. That, that, that he didn't draw the distinction between economics and ethics, which incidentally, what Adam Smith attempted in his first warrior book, The Moral Sentiment, and his later volume, The Wealth of Nations. Thus, the economics that permits one country to prey upon another are immoral, just as it is for any company to use their, their access to the powers of the state to prevent their competitors or to capture markets which they couldn't earn in an in a open competition. Next one. Yeah. So that's my, that's my initial attempt to integrate Gandhi in, and make him relevant in the 21st century, particularly the parallel between Gandhi, a political entrepreneur, and the world today where we need to find economic entrepreneurs as well as political entrepreneurs who would realize the horrors that they are bringing, up, bringing upon the world by invoking the state as the savior. Thank you. Varun, thank you so much for that. It was fascinating. And it was interesting for me to hear you invoke um, Adam Smith because um, it seemed to me that one of the subtexts of what you were saying, and it was a brilliant presentation and it taught us a lot uh, not least about so much which is in plain sight in India, but that too many people overlook and don't understand. One of the things you remind me of, though, is that quote from Adam Smith, um, when he says, um, people of the same profession or trade seldom get together, even for merriment and diversion, but soon the conversation turns into a conspiracy against the public interest. Of course, you're familiar with that quote. What he was arguing actually was that very few people, when they get any uh, power in a market, um, when they become big, uh, when they become successful, they very quickly seek legislative favor. They want to get into bed with the parliament, the king, the queen, the president, the members of parliament, the regulators, the people who license or whatever, because of course, the one thing they want um, is not just endless competition and potential challenges from new market entrants or people who can do things quicker and better and cheaper, but what they want um, is they want legislative favor to put barriers to entry to protect them. And um, um, I can now understand how it is that you're arguing that um, that yes, that in India, some of those big urban glittery um, forces um, um, and some of the people who win majorities and are able to use the coercive and regulatory and licensed power of the state uh, try and keep it to an extent, the poor poor um, and try to exclude people from the power of freedom and engagement and uh, legitimacy and all those things. So um, I learned so much uh, this evening and I thank you for it. Um, Barun, if I may, we have some questions here. Um, uh, um, a couple are, is the control of corruption uh, as significant of, uh, as all of this? So I think that's someone who's, who's, who's understanding the point that in those street markets, in that informal uh, you know, economy, lots of bent vendors are suffering the power of local government, police authorities, uh, and all those things. But is it really as, as big as that? And another question here is how has COVID uh, distorted the dramatic downward trend that, that you allude to in 2019 to 21, i.e. is that something 
um, that that is 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 a slightly different episode. So those are two good ones. Uh, if we could start with those, please. I mean, I, I mentioned the issue of corruption and the informal sector because it affects the largest section of the population. But obviously, once we have systems in place, it would affect everyone at every level. Which is why, which is exactly what has happened. The fact that and which is why I wanted to show the distinction or the, diff, uh, the, the divergence between South Korea and India, that despite all our attempts to reform, liberalize the industrial sector, which is what happened in the 1990s, or there was an attempt first to reduce tariff, then to deregulate, de-license large chunk of the economy, yet they barely skimmed the surface, which is exactly why a generation later almost 30 years later, we are not witnessing the kind of transformation that South Korea did in 30 years. The failure is not in our agriculture. Indian agriculture has been, and some of you may know that there's a huge farmers protest going on in India against some laws that the government brought in in the name of reform and liberalization. And the farmers were against it, or they are against it. Even I argued against it that, that these reforms were centralizing power in the name of reforms and they were not liberalization at all. They would not empower the farmers, rather they would empower the state and their cronies. But what it shows is that Indian fire agriculture, which was a basket case in 1970s, where people had virtually written off India and Bangladesh and such countries that they, won't, they can't be fed so the world should focus elsewhere. To today, India for the last 20 years and more has been a major agriculture exporter, a net food exporter. The export, uh, we export about $40 billion a year in recent years. Yet, 40% of children are hungry, malnourished. The world hunger index this year placed India at 101 out of 116. It's not because India doesn't produce food. It's because a lot of Indians don't have access to food. And that access, that limited access is precisely because they have not been able to move out of the informal economy, nor have they been able to move out of agriculture. Not because they don't want to, but because there are no alternative options. Indian regulatory, uh, regulatory system has handicapped health and education, two of the most regulated sectors. As a result, the basic capacities needed for a transition to a modern economy is lacking in a large section of the population. On top of that, the regulatory bottleneck in the non-farm sector has crippled it to the extent that that can only be understood if we compare it to South, South Korea, which is why I showed that. That it is not something that came as part of nature's gift to India. It's something that the, the political ideals and the, and the political power chose to impose on India. And which is why I, showed, I shared with you my favorite uh, from the informal economy, because it shows how competent, how potentially powerful a large sections of Indians in the informal sector are who are able to manufacture vehicles to meet their demand when the formal sector cannot. So it's not anything that's lacking in the people. It's everything that we have done wrong with, this, with using the state to cripple the social sector and thereby handicap the people in terms of education and health, and then cripple the non-farm sector where people could have transited as people normally do as, so as societies develop. Yeah, so, you know, uh, as for the pandemic, 
I think that was a, uh, the, 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 the virus may have been man-made or natural, but the lockdowns were surely man-made. And we had the most draconian lockdown without any thought as to what would happen to the hundreds of millions who are in the informal sector. Millions walked hundreds of kilometers to get back to their villages because it's the agriculture they could rely on. The industries and the businesses and the cities had shut down to save themselves. I mean, this is the, 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 the lockdown and its impact on the economy has had to be seen to be believed. The collapse of the economy in 2020 was not an accident. It was not uh, uh, God's wrath on India. It was a political choice that we made because the political leaders wanted to score a point that India can lock down better than China or anybody else. Varun, we have two questions I want to put to you. Uh, one is from uh, a lady called Elizabeth. She says, in terms of policy writing and implementation, what are the significant issues faced within the government and their implications to society. So it's, you know, what's going on within the government and what do you think whatever's going on, how does that relate to the urban glitter you described, but also the um, somewhat imprisoned perhaps people who um, go almost unrecognized and endangered in that informal economy. And the second question here is someone who says, this is interesting, a great discussion. Thank you, they say. It's quite interesting that in the latest survey by Deloitte, um, that India remains an attractive investment destination given its skilled workforce. Your point that Indians are highly skilled, whether they're in the urban glitter or in those sectors that are recognized or in the informal. Um, uh, uh, and it, that it's got a healthy prospectus of economic growth. You know, have they got it wrong or are they actually missing a bigger picture? I think taking the second one first, I think it's, you know, it's always a question of half empty and half full. And getting the priorities right or wrong. Because of course, uh, the informal sector to me is a great sign indication of the culture that prevails at the grassroots. That in the 21st century, they can manufacture computers to automobile to meet the demands at the, for the largest sections of the population is something that has to be seen to be believed. So there's nothing wrong with the people or the character or their morale or whatever. It's the institutional arrangement that is designed now to block them so that a few cronies can benefit. There can't be any other explanation. That, that so many Indians have been so successful abroad but Indians struggle to succeed at home. That's precisely because the Indian establishment, irrespective of political color, have used the institutions to strangle the, strangle the community and benefit their favorites. And therefore I'm not surprised that, that, uh, that uh, I mean, for the last 30 or 40 years, there has been repeated projections that India will emerge, but it is still emerging. We have not yet arrived. And the potential has not been realized. And it's not an accident, it's a tragedy. And the lockdown and the pandemic showed how huge the cost can be. The first, question, uh, uh, yeah. the first question is uh, was about you know what's going on within the government, um, yeah. the, what is the 
I guess, the policy and political discourse and what will the implications of the boundaries of that discourse be uh, for Indian society in all its many varied strata and permeations? I think one big challenge we currently have after a long time, after a generation perhaps, is that a government with a political majority thinks it has the solutions. Which is why the graph that I showed you is so telling. That it is during the sustained coalition governments of 25 years that India's growth rate grew steadily, slowly, but surely. With the re-emergence re of political dominance by one party, after the initial spurt or the momentum, the growth has plunged and has continued to plunge. It's not a coincidence. Political competition and the economic competition go together. That's what democracy is all about. That is why democracy can never be majority, majority rule. Because if it is majority rule, that would be the end of, of the markets or the freedom for the people. Because the majority will enslave, will have the right to enslave the minority. Democracy is never about majority rule. It's about the freedom of the minority to try to win over the others to their way of thinking. Our this is our this has been our, our our and that graph actually I did it ten years ago and I redid it now and it holds as much today as it as when I first did it in 2012. That the coalition politics with all its messiness created the economic space. That is political competition and economic competition went hand in hand. Political dominance of the earlier era and today is actually stifling economic competition and therefore economic growth. It's benefiting the cronies at the cost of the citizens. Varun, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I know uh, because people have been texting me on my telephone. Um, you've been discussing informal economies. Um, well, there's always an informal chat route and people have been texting me saying how much they're enjoying this and how brilliant you've been. Um, we've been recording it. Um, it will no doubt go up on YouTube. Uh, we will push it as far and as wide as we can. Uh, you've been brilliant. You've been fascinating. I've learned a lot. And uh, I know that the people watching this will learn and have learned a lot as well. So it is with immense gratitude um, that, um, that I, on behalf of all our viewers uh, this evening, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Lovely seeing you after a while. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to, to think about something that was building in my mind, but I hadn't actually put it down in a more tangible form. So like I said, I, this is my own learning. And uh, yeah, so thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's an absolute pleasure. And you know, uh, Middlesex University, we have, we're, we're one of the top 15 most diverse universities um, in the world. We have huge numbers of students and indeed colleagues from all around the world. We have a very large campus in North London. We have campuses in Mauritius, Malta, Dubai. Uh, we have offices in Africa, Hong Kong. Uh, we span the globe. And I think we're, it's fair to say we're the only British university since the year 2000 that have won uh, the Queen's Award for International Enterprise twice. Um, and um, one of the things that I think makes us uh, the institution that we are, and it's in our DNA to be disruptive, um, is that we like to ask questions uh, of power and authority um, and things that appear to be given and timeless. We like to ask disruptive and difficult questions. 
and you've absolutely been uh, a rich part of our tradition this evening. So thank you so much and thank everyone for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>